Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, the purpose of this session is to provide a, a information back to the community in result of our investigation of water stability and in particular around the issue of copper pipe corrosion in the Gloucester water system. We have in the past had um, some concerns being raised. They have been referenced back because our water supply does um, largely comply with the drinking water quality standards. But in the more recent times, myself and my colleagues at council, who I'll introduce shortly, um, have been looking at those at that history. And we, what we wanted to do is make sure that we fully understand the background and the history of the issue and that we're better positioned um, to, one, provide information to the community in the future, but also to look at how we can improve what it is that we're doing that will, hot, that will benefit everything into the future. So without too much of further ado, um, I'd like to introduce tonight, or welcome tonight, um, Chenzi Zeng, our Manager of Water Treatment and, and um, Water Management. Um, Chenzi has an extensive back background in process engineering and chemical engineering. Um, similar to myself, my background, I'm, I'm Robert Scott, I'm Council's Director of Infrastructure and Engineering Services. I have a background in civil and environmental engineering and an extensive experience in water. Um, also joining us tonight is our colleagues um, who from our consultant City Water Technologies um, is Mr Bruce Murray, our Engineering Director for City Water Technologies and more importantly the star of our, our organisation today which is Jessica Sosa, the Engineering Manager with City Water Technologies. Um, Jess in particular holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology, in biology as well as postgraduate diploma and a Master of Engineering in Chemical and Biomolecular. Um, she's worked extensively through all of Eastern Australian states, applying her special skills and knowledge to water and wastewater systems for many different clients. Um, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge special guests that we had, which is Councillor Catherine Bell. Um, and what we're hoping the session will be able to do is run for about 30 minutes with a presentation on the report that was provided to the council meeting back on um, last month. We'll then have a 15 to 20 minutes of question time and we'll also then at the end of question time be able to talk about what our plans are for the future and, and where to from here. Importantly, we have chosen um, due to the COVID restrictions to work off our, um, our Zoom platform. We would have rather be in person, but uh, it's still an important issue that we really want to communicate back out with those people who are interested. So we're really keen to uh, make this Zoom session work. What we'd appreciate people doing is remain muted um, where they can. If they've got a question, don't hesitate to pop it into the chat button at the bottom. So if you click that bottom, you can um, chat, you can send a question to us. And as we're going through the presentation, if it's appropriate, we'll, we'll answer them. If not, we can save them to the end and answer them then. Um, there's also an opportunity that if your connection, for whatever reason, gets a bit fuzzy, um, turn off your camera. That will help to, um, to, to get us through. And hopefully um, everyone enjoys the meeting and we can make it a really productive session. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jess to um, take control of the presentation. Thanks, Rob. So I had my little intro on who I am and, and what I do, but I think you covered that pretty well. So senior um, uh, chemical process engineer, um, chartered engineer. Um, but in my time working in uh, with City Water Technology, I have been seconded to a few roles and I've actually worked in a few offices with councils, um, working with like Gympie Regional Council, uh, Queensland Urban Utilities and Taswater and actually sat with them in their offices and worked with them. So I'll just get straight into the presentation. So today we're talking about the Gloucester Water Treatment Plant and water stability. Um, these are the topics we'll cover and one should feed into the other. So first of all, a bit of background context, why we are having this talk um, and what are the concerns. Then I want to walk you through the water treatment plant, which originally we were hoping to do this on site in person, um, and, and maybe there's a possibility for that later, but walk you through the water treatment plant, how all the individual steps work in order to convert that water that we pull out of the Barrington River into the water that arrives at your tap. Then I want to go into what is water stability and corrosivity potential. And once we, we have some measures, some numbers about the, the corrosivity potentials, what do those numbers mean? And a good way to get a bit of an understanding about what the numbers mean is to compare them to other local government areas. So if you ever hear me drop into the words LGA, which I tend to do because we speak about them all the time, that just means your local gov government areas. 
Um, and the last three slides, if, if you didn't get bored during the presentation or you did get bored in the presentation, the last three slides will just really bring together everything that we've talked about and where council plans to go from there before we jump into the Q&A. So the background. So the Barrington River, from where the Gloucester Water Treatment Plant gets the water, it's typically low in pH, alkalinity and hardness. And you'll hear these three throughout this presentation, the pH, alkalinity, hardness. If it's low, water tends to be corrosive. So that water, um, the irony with the Barrington River is it's a good water quality source. It's clean. And clean water tends to be corrosive water. So... Um, what uh, this is pretty consistent with a lot of raw water sources across the east coast of Australia and Tasmania. Um, the walls, the water has low pH, alkalinity, and hardness. So these waters, they can be corrosive to metals uh, such as uh, copper and brass pipes and fittings, and they can leach minerals out of your cement pipes or cement reservoirs. So they just uh, pull out the minerals, and it gets carried into the water body. So water quality complaints have arisen in Gloucester and Barrington, which may be attributed to several factors, including water age and the water corrosivity. And pipe replacements in homes around Gloucester and Barrington have been partially mapped. Uh, there's just an excerpt of one of the maps. Um, that's just the Gloucester region. And council's been working together with plumbers in the area to, to try and highlight where those different areas are. So what are issues caused by corrosive water? Now, generally speaking, water quality is considered the main contributing factor. So that is the constituents in the water or rather lack thereof. So like I was saying before, water is uh, a pure water or distilled water actually is acidic, um, it's corrosive in nature, and it's a lack of having those minerals, alkalinity, hardness in there that does make it uh, corrosive. But there are other factors like in uh, all engineering problems and in life in general, it's never one cause for everything. So uh, bioorganisms on pipe walls are a key one. Um, that's not anything to worry about. It's pretty normal to have biofilm um, on your pipe walls. Reticulation design and layout, the pipe materials and the quality of manufacture. In, in fact, I'll talk a little bit um, later about copper manufacture and how that's evolved um, through the ages in order to be more resilient to corrosion. Um, the life of your asset, obviously, the older something gets, the less well it works. So for a copper asset, it's usually 50 to 80 years. You can get lucky, you can go up even higher. Um, but again, it depends on, on how that uh, asset is used. And the water use characteristics that could be, is it in a hot water system? Do you use it frequently, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the problems that you get from corrosive water, um, high pH at the extremities of the reticulation, that just means at your tap. So if uh, you do have cement line pipes and so on, the water is corrosive as it travels through the pipe, it strips out the minerals and what you end up with is with a higher pH at the end of the network. Now, that's not bad for, for uh, you necessarily, but it does affect your disinfection, chlorine disinfection performance. So how well that chlorine will then attack bacteria and viruses in water is reduced if our pH is too high. And I'll go more into that later because there's a bit of an interplay between wanting to keep our pH high enough that the water's not corrosive, but not too high that the disinfection doesn't work. And then as we all know, one of the other key things that we get uh, with corrosive water is pinning corrosion and blue water um, from copper pipes. So just to expand quickly on those last two, this is a um, blown up image of what a pitting in copper pipes uh, or copper assets looks like. Um, and it uh, is basically localised non-uniform corrosion. They form pits or holes which rupture. Um, and they can begin, they usually do concentrate around points of microbiological mass. So that's what I was talking about before, the biofilm um, and where they grow or the, they have the propensity to grow where water may remain stagnant, um, they can cause this as well. So also too, this was a really recognised issue, um, uh, the pitting corrosion, um, such that in 1996, they brought out a standard in Europe, it's the BSEN 1057, to improve the manufacture of copper in such a way to minimise this pitting. And that standard there is called the copper and the copper alloys, seamless round copper tubes for water and gas and blah, blah, blah. Um, but basically what this standard done was in the manufacturing process, removal of carbon films from the bore of the copper pipes. 
So since the introduction of that standard, um, they have been finding that the incidences of, so since 1996 um, post-installation, they've been finding the incidences of pitting have greatly reduced and that that pipework is much more resilient to water corrosion. The other thing uh, that may be noted with your copper acids is blue waters. And you tend to see this in your, um, your bathrooms, in the shower, around the toilet, that, that blue stain there. Um, and that's uh, to do with the release of copper. That's you're actually seeing copper there in, in the sink on the right. Um, there are many, uh, the, one of the key ways to control this, um, the recommended is to flush the pipes. By flushing the pipe, you're drawing chlorine residual that's offered at the water treatment plant through the pipe. And that actually attacks any biofilm that is leading to the corrosion of this, uh, of the copper pipe to mitigate it. So we'll talk about that more in mitigation strategies. So just in the last slide to do with the context of this presentation. So what we were asked by council um, to do was to look at their historical data. And we took 10 years of data. We wanted it to be uh, most relevant to what, how we're performing at the moment. So we looked at 10 years of data. We measured the corrosivity potential of that treated water just as it left the plant before it was uh, delivered to the reticulation and onwards to the customers in Gloucester and Barrington. And then once we got the numbers around that, we wanted to say, how did they compare to the other local government areas? Um, so there will be a section on benchmarking. But before I go into the particulars on corrosion, I'll just go through the water treatment plant process um, and how we get your water to your tap. So basically a water treatment plant is essentially a factory for making drinking water. And they're specifically designed, so every water treatment plant is unique to the raw water source that it's taken from. So you can take water from bores, you can take it from rivers, lakes, you can take it from the ocean, and that water treatment plant is designed to treat that specific water with its own characteristics. And then ultimately, the water treatment plant or this water factory is broken up into stages of treatment, and each of those treatment stages, whether they're physical treatment like filtration or chemical treatment like chlorination, they're each designed to remove constituents from water or add constituents to water to convert it into that drinking water. So I'll just go into a little bit about the water first before we get to the plant. What does the water look like in Barrington River? So we've already said it's low in pH, alkalinity and hardness. And here are some graphs um, that have been put together by council. So you probably can't see the text along the bottom. It's quite small, but the navy blue is Gloucester. The dots on the bottom is Bulladella. Um, Menning is in yellow and Shroud is in green. And you can just see, relatively speaking, the Gloucester pH is quite low, um, or the Barrington River, I should say, um, raw water pH is quite low. So it's corrosive compared to your other sites. That's for alkalinity. Again, that navy blue uh, dots there shows that the alkalinity is on average probably lower than the other sites and the same for calcium hardness. So we pretty much established, we know that the water there um, is characteristically more corrosive. So the water treatment plant. So when the water arrives at the plant, it's received at rapid mixed tanks. And this rapid mixed tank, it consists of four compartments and they're each uh, installed with vertical mixes. The idea of those vertical mixes is they beat up the water and they want to ensure that when you put chemical in, chemical being denser than water, that it can't sink to the bottom and that by being rapidly mixed, it is, um, it's been dispersed through the water column and not um, collecting at the bottom of the tank. So these are the chemicals that we dose at the rapid mix tank. So the first is soda ash. So soda ash is the key one in improving water stability. We talk about improving water stability. We're also talking about improving water corrosivity. And it's really about raising that pH, raising that alkalinity and hardness to get the water more uh, passive rather than corrosive. After that, we dose ACH and polymer. So ACH is a coagulant. You may have heard this um, before, um, particularly if you take aspirin or waterfarin medication, you've got blood clotting illness. A coagulant is anything that clots something. So what the ACH does is takes all that particulate, the dirt, all the dirty stuff in water, and it makes it clump together. The polymer follows, and that polymer basically gets all those clumps, or we call them plock in the industry, 
gets all that flock, makes those stick together and they get heavier and then you're able to settle them out of your water stream and leave clean water behind. Now that happens downstream. After the rapid mixing tank, we go to the flocculation tank. So in the top right is just um, the top view down, uh, the water traveling underneath those grills there through the compartments. And in the bottom right, um, there's a flow plan and we're in the yellow section of that flow plant of the plant. Um, so from the rapid mix tank, water flows to the flocculation tank. They're designed for about 10 minutes. And, and during that 10 minutes, these flock will start to form. They look like a uh, sort of fluffy particulate in the water. At the end of the flocculation tank, the operators uh, will take grab samples for pH. And the reason they do this is they want to verify that they're meeting their target pH um, in order to minimise that corrosivity. So if the pH is too high, they will wind back their soda ash dosing. And if it's too low, they'll do the inverse. So that's considered a control point. That is basically somewhere where you take a measurement, you make a, um, you make a call about the performance of of a certain treatment and you make adjustments accordingly. So from the flocculation tank, water then goes to the clarifier that's there in the top right. So as the, the name sort of implies, the clarifier clarifies the water. And this is where all those flocks that we talked about, they get settled out. So they're made heavy by the polymer, they are made to sink to the bottom and the clarified water that's left behind floats over the top of the weir and downstream. Then the sludge that's on the bottom, that gets uh, scraped off and um, taken out of the water stream. Now, the clear water, so you can see we're moving down um, in that flow plan on the right-hand side, we're moving down um, into now the filters. So the clarified water, it's split between two media filters. Each media uh, filter contains filter sand. So at the bottom of that filter media or where the sand is sitting, there is a, what they call a plenum floor and it contains 480 nozzles. What happens, the water comes in, um, it passes through that filter bed and this is where all the polishing is done. Any leftover flock particulate gets caught up in the sand bed and the clear water falls below out the bottom um, through those nozzles. Now, all that particulate that's caught up, that gets washed out of those filters periodically, usually about twice a week or in response to climbing turbidity. Turbidity is just a measure of the water clarity. This is measured downstream in the process. So whenever you hear me talk about a turbidity meter or turbidity, we're talking about how clear the water is. Um, so, when, uh, so operators will keep an eye on that turbidity meter, um, which is located off the clear water tank uh, downstream. And if that starts to climb up, they will um, instigate another backwash. So again, that's a monitoring point. Um, we call it that filtration critical control point. And we want to keep that turbidity within measures to guarantee the quality of the turbidity of the water, I should say. Um, it's also a really important, um, uh, I suppose, measure for the removal of crypto. If we're achieving usually uh, about a 0.3 NTU, we're effectively removing um, enough cryptosporidium from your water. So after we leave those filters, um, water collects in a pipe where so sodium fluoride, um, like in your toothpaste, um, is dosed for dental hygiene. Again, like with uh, the other critical control points or operational control points, a fluoride meter is constantly measuring online the fluoride residual. If it gets too high, they will ramp back the fluoride dose. If it gets too low, they will ramp it up. So we're always trying to target um, the range that's set out by the, uh, code of, um, the, the COP for fluoridation. So from the after fluoridation, water falls into, a, um, into an inspection pit where sodium hypochlorite, or you probably know it as chlorine, is dosed for disinfection of pathogens. And this is a real key step here for removing bacteria and viruses. So that sodium hypo, it's dosed, and then the water travels into the clear water tank or clear water reservoir, which provides necessary contact time. So we usually have to allow about 30 minutes for that chlorine and that water to mix in and to uh, inactivate bacteria and viruses. From that tank, the water is then transferred um, via two uh, suction pumps to the Gloucester and Barrington reticulations. Again, a chlorine analyzer also located off this tank and that measures the performance of that chlorination system. The chlorine residual is too high, the sodium hypochlorite dosing will be ramped back and vice versa. 
Once we leave the plant, the water either travels off to Barrington or it is uh, fills uh, one of three reservoirs in the uh, Gloucester system before being on supply to customers in the area. And this is basically the process all on one page, um, showing the water entering the plant, going into those rapid mixed tanks where we dose soda ash um, to minimise corrosion, the ACH and the polymer for flock formation, um, through the flocculation tank that flock forms, it gets settled out in the clarifier, water gets polished in the filters, we dose fluoride, then we're in a hypochlorite or chlorine for disinfection, it's then stored in the clear water tank and supplied onwards to town. So that's the water treatment plant and um, basically how it works. So now I'm just going to dive into the more technical uh, part of the presentation about water stability and corrosivity potential. So water stability and corrosivity potential it can be measured many ways. We can look at pH and isolation, alkalinity, hardness, uh, and a few other indices. I'm just going to go through the key ones. So pH is a number that expresses the acidity or the alkalinity of a solution on a logarithmic scale, which just means 10 to the power of something. But I just put to make it more interesting in the bottom right corner there, just to give you an idea of different pHs. So there we've got uh, water sits at about seven. Pure water, that is demineralized water, clean, clean water, is actually more towards the left of that. It's about 6. 6.7, 6.5, uh, I'd have to get the exact numbers, but it's actually corrosive by nature. Um, and for any of you that uh, drink Coca-Cola, it's about 2.7, not far off from your stomach acids. And on the other end of the extreme, your highly alkaline solutions are pretty much what you find under your bathroom sink. So that is pH. The lower the pH, as we've been talking about, the higher the corrosivity. Now, the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines, this is just the guidance in Australia of this is the water, um, this is the quality that it should be. They recommend a pH range anywhere between 6.5 and 8.5. Now, this is very broad and um, usually a, um, a more acceptable narrow range is targeted. And what we tend to target in reality is something around 7.6. And this is very important, and, and I'll explain more later on why we go for this number. But if we go higher, whilst we're minimising our corrosivity, whilst our water is actually becoming something like scaling, which is the opposite of corrosion, it's where sediment forms and can actually protect your assets, what happens at the higher end is your disinfection stops working. So you can put as much chlorine as you want in there. It's about 40 times less effective at a pH of 8 versus a pH of 7. So we have to usually go for a trade-off somewhere between uh, maximising uh, the water stability, making it stable, less corrosive as possible, while not affecting the disinfection potential. That's the Barrington River. Um, the median value for pH is 7.4. Uh, when it arrives at the plant, after soda ash dosing and passing through the plant, council achieves medium average of 8.1. So that, again, that's, that's more on that higher end. And the objective here is we want to deal with that corrosive raw water, um, add the soda ash and aim for the higher end. Now I'll go into why we are quite high compared to that 7.8 target. Now, alkalinity. Alkalinity is another key measure, um, and it's basically the capacity for, uh, for the water to resist changes to pH fluctuations and to neutralise acid. So for anyone that's out there that's maybe a bit more chemical-minded, it's the sum of hydroxides, carbonates, bicarbonates. These are just your minerals in water. And what those chemicals do uh, or compounds do is they take the hydrogen atoms, which is what makes something acidic, takes them out of the water and then therefore lowers the acidity or raises the pH. So at water utilities, um, we tend to target more than 40 milligrams per litre to avoid corrosivity. This is where we sit. So the Barrington River median alkalinity is 25. By the time it leaves the plant, it's 33. So we actually are a bit below target. Um, and that is interesting what we could do to mitigate this is to dose more soda ash as we were talking about earlier but if we dose more soda ash your ph will go even higher and then your disinfection is compromised so we 
aim for the middle ground of about a 33 milligrams per litre. Now, what are the other measures of corrosivity potential? So in industry, these are um, highly um, used indices or measures to say something about the corrosivity of water. So there is two things, the calcium carbonate precipitation potential, and I'll just call it CCPP, and the Langley Saturation Index, which is the LSI. And you calculate, you put numbers in about the pH, the alkalinity, sulfates, hardness, et cetera, et cetera, of water into a model. They call this the Rothbank Tamburini Windsor model. It's just a uh, computational analysis in Excel and outspits a CCPP number and an LSI. So the beauty of these measures is it doesn't just look at pH and it doesn't just look at alkalinity. It looks at a whole suite of water quality parameters to give you a most accurate view of the whole picture. So on the right-hand side, I've just put a key there. Now, depending on what number CCPP we end up with, an LSI number will tell us something about our final water, our treated water. Now, if it is below uh, zero, sorry, higher than zero, it's scaling. If we want to be, for CCPP, we want to be somewhere between minus five and zero. And if as we head into the more negative numbers, we become more corrosive. Now, before I go into what is modelled, um, I'll talk about scenario selection. So when you model, you can do one thing. You can put in one set of pH number, one set of alkalinity on one certain day, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can look at, like we did, a period of data, 10 years of data, because we want to see the full suite of what happened over those 10 years. So we look for scenarios. So we take a worst case scenario and we look at what was the worst pH, the worst alkalinity? And these are the low ones. Uh, worst pH, alkalinity, hardness. And there's other, um, other uh, parameters that go into it, like sulfides. And we plug those into our rothberg Temperini model to calculate then the CCPP and LSI. We also look at typical case and best case. So here's a bit of a visual in the middle there. That's the RTW model. There's a lot of background um, calculations that I haven't included here, but it does it automatically. I can't take credit for it. I just put the numbers in the box on the left. I put in the numbers for the pH, when it was at its worst case, the alkalinity, hardness, temperature, and sulfates. And the model does all the work for me. It brings out, it uh, spits out that CCPP and LSI. I tabulated those numbers. I repeated the same thing for scenario two, which is the typical case, what you would expect to have at your tap most of the time and the best case. And this is what we found. So that table there below the three columns, the column colored column on the left, um, minus 5.51 and minus 1.68 represented the worst case CCPP and LSI that the model came. And what this told us is under the worst case conditions, uh, the water was mildly corrosive according to the CCPP and corrosive according to the LSI. Under your typical case, that is most of the time, your CCP um, is uh, indicated that the water is stable. So it's neither scaling or corrosive, but the LSI um, it, it still indicated that it was mildly corrosive. And then under the best case, we're heading towards a scenario where we have stable water. So now that we got those numbers, what do they mean? Well, we know we've got slightly corrosive water um, and under the worst case condition, we've, we've got uh, even more corrosive water, but how do we compare? So I went back into our records, the CWT, just to do a bit of a benchmarking exercise to see how we're performing compared to other water utilities and what mitigation strategies we might wanna put in place. So in 1999, the Department of Land, Water and Conservation um, engaged City Water Technology um, to collect data from 128 local councils in country New South Wales at the time. And it was to do this for the purposes of minimising corrosion. So it was a recognised issue along a lot of water utilities or local government areas, um, and the department wanted to learn more about it. So they asked City Water uh, Technology to collect all the data um, and come up with some strategies. So of the 128 local council areas that were contacted, we got 59 responses. So almost half of them responded. And the following was found. So the top three are probably the most interesting. 32% 
of the responses said, yep, we've got copper corrosion. And of those 32, 42% um, identified that copper corrosion through pitting and through blue water. So we then looked at the CCPP numbers, the LSIA and the PH. And according to those numbers, 60% of these local government areas, this is just in New South Wales, 60% potentially have corrosive water. So that is actually more than the, than the ones reporting it. So then I took the numbers that we, uh, we got out of the Rothberg Tamburini Windsor model for the CCPP and LSI. And I wanted to compare them to a whole lot of other studies that we have done um, in the last 10 years or so. Um, and some of them very recently for other local water, um, uh, local governments. Um, now, it should be stated that with the different studies that we compared for the other corrosivity projects that we've done, there is um, different raw water sources, of course, a different water treatment plant. Going back to what I said originally, water treatment plants are designed for water sources. Some are uh, more sophisticated than other. Um, also, the methodology used to determine the CCPP and the LSI, those corrosivity measures, um, may have varied depending on what available data we had. And then the size of the, the sample set um, was uh, would vary as well. So in some instances, we'd have a thousand data points and in others only 20. And this is what we found. So there is an image on the right. Those data points in blue show what they indicate. The size of those data points indicates how big the sample size of, uh, is or was. So as we say in science, repeatability is the key. So the bigger the sample size, the more evidence you've got for something, the more reliable we find that data. So I just aim to show here the reliability of the data in terms of the, the size of those uh, circles there. So the zones, the green zone on that graph indicates that water is stable, um, performed really well. The, um, the yellow background uh, zone indicates that water is either not corrosive or mildly corrosive. And then in the red zone, and by the way, we're talking about average, average conditions here. And in the red zone, we, sh we show that the water is corrosive or aggressive. And so Gloucester there showing in the green, uh, sorry, not in the green, in the red, um, is how it compared to the other sites. So performing uh, better than some and worse than others. So uh, this is the last few slides. I said if you didn't uh, take anything in from the previous slides, maybe uh, these three will basically sum it up for you. So we know Barrington River, clean water source, typically low in pH, alkalinity and hardness. This is very consistent with raw water sources along the east coast of Australia and Tasmania. So we dose soda ash. Um, that soda ash drives up that pH and alkalinity to reduce the overall corrosivity potential. From the treated water data set we looked at, which was almost about 500 data points, under the typical conditions, we found that the water was passive or it wasn't corrosive. Um, whereas the LSI, so sorry, it was passive or not corrosive when we looked at CCPP value, however the LSI indicated the water was typically corrosive. So overall, Basically, um, based on the range of values we saw in the 10 years of the data set and from that modelling, it's reasonable to surmise that the supply of water is periodically corrosive. From the benchmarking exercise we found with the other local government areas, um, we showed that um, for the CCPP, which tends to be the more reliable measure of corrosivity, um, the Gloucester performed better than the other sites. In terms of the LSI, Gloucester performed marginally worse. But then corrosivity or water quality, it's not the whole story. Um, and given the fact that the water is not definitively highly corrosive, um, there, are, there can be, and there usually is other factors that, um, an interplay of other factors. So what are our recommendations for the customers? So um, as with any, and I'm sure uh, most, we ensure that any new pipe installations are manufactured and installed in accordance with relevant plumbing codes. And I've just put a link down there that's publicly accessible information on the web and not too difficult to navigate through and understand. Um, the other is uh, where we do recognise uh, that water can be corrosive is considering the installation of the sacrificial anodes um, to uh, plumbing installations. Quite often you'll see these on hot water heaters. Um, and what they are is they're um, 
they are little devices that will corrode more readily than the metal that you are trying to protect in this instance, the copper. Um, you do have to replace them uh, according to your manufacturing instructions and depending on the, the degree of uh, degradation of, of that anode. Now, where you are doing copper replacements in home, it can be recommended that you replace that pipe with PEX pipe or similar. Um, this is a good substitute for copper and is highly resistant to corrosive water. And periodically flush pipes. This is a key one, um, particularly where we may get pinning um, corrosion or um, blue water from biofilms. And they tend to, like I said, they tend to um, propagate in pipes where the water is stagnant, where there might be dead ends in your system. Um, where they grow, they can cause um, proper, um, uh, pitting corrosion. And so what we ask is that you flush the pipe that draws in hot water and or chlorinated water, and that chlorine will help mitigate uh, some of their growth. So council, um, on completion of this project last month, we submitted our findings to council and in response to that council, and they may be talking more on this later, so I'll just be brief. Council will be investigating potential options and costs for interim and long-term modification of your treatment process to get even better water quality. So um, some of these options in the immediate term maybe, or the interim term, maybe modification of the existing chemical configurations and improving the online water quality feedback. So if you cast your mind back when to, we were talking about the um, process description and we have online instrumentation that was continuously monitoring the chlorine, the fluoride, the pH, um, improving this instrumentation allows operators to respond quickly to changes in the water quality to ensure that the treated water coming out the plant is uh, optimised. In the longer term, um, Council is looking to pilot potentially new chemical delivery systems such as instead of soda ash, lime and carbon dioxide. Now, these two are great together because what they'll do is they'll allow us to draw our P to a target a lower pH to improve our disinfection performance, but allow us then to add that additional alkalinity to improve on the condition of the water and overall reduce the corrosivity potential. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, and now I'll hand it back to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, I really appreciate that. On behalf of council and the community, we appreciate your time tonight. I unfortunately, couldn't be there in person because it would have been great to have you host you in Gloucester ourselves. But um, yeah, we appreciate your time to deliver um, the results of your findings. I will throw it open to anyone who has a question. If you'd like to unmute yourself, we don't have anything in the, the chat to, to ask, but if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, there is an opportunity now for some questions of any of the um, the council staff I've introduced or the CWT team um, about the work, about the presentation or any other question that's hot on people's minds tonight. Uh, while people are, are thinking about that, um, I might just add, and, and that was that was a great presentation, Jess, um, that another thing that um, uh, some of the electricians do is, is connect uh, earth um, some of the electrical systems to the copper pipes. And um, that can also set up some um, galvanic cell corrosion in copper. So it's also best to remind the electricians to put their separate earthing rods in rather than use the copper pipe water system. Yeah, that's certainly something that I've come across in the past before as well, Bruce, where we've found a, um, an earth to be crossed with the copper pipe or where we've had dissimilar metals used, um, particularly copper pipe and the old GAL services that also um, cause some problems in water services themselves related to that material. And it's a bit different from the water quality that issues that we're talking about more generally there, but they can be causes as well. Yeah, and the old gal pipes, uh, they corroded pretty fast in most of the areas where they were put in, so not many of those left, unfortunately. As Jess was saying, I think that's a, that's a consequence of having a really good quality water source in the first place because there's not a lot in it to start off with a lot of the time. Uh, and um, we're very fortunate, I think, particularly on the Mid-North Coast councils that I've worked for, they largely have um, you know, very good water quality. You, can, you get good clarity for it and you can see really well in the natural water down to depths, which is um, a very good indicator of, of the quality of the water that we've got. Um, 
If we don't have any other questions, by all means, people feel free to ask questions. You can always email um, council after, afterwards, myself and Chenzi as well, at any point in time, we're more than happy to. And one of the things we would like to do in the future, as we alluded to earlier, is actually have an open day and host it at the plant um, where we can take people through and actually show you. It's one thing to talk about it and see a picture that Jess had, um, but it is a total thing separate to that to, to walk through and talk with our operators and our staff about what they do and why. Um, we're really proud of the, the work that we've been able to do over all of our plants and, um, and certainly um, we wouldn't hesitate to have a discussion with anyone around that. Um, so it's something we look forward to. Any questions? Are you there? Uh, I've got a question. Yes, um, David. Yeah, yeah, is that for David? Yep. Yeah, okay. Look, I built a set of units in Denison Street, a set of four units, 15 years ago. I have recently had two leaks with major damage to the units um, from copper pipe pitting. Um, uh, these are the main, in the unit that is leaking so far, it was the main inlet line. Um, so it's not a um, stagnant issue. It's a high flow pipe, which then feeds into the smaller pipes throughout the units. Uh, and this is just in one unit. So I'm waiting for a potential for all the other units to have the same problem. Um, I think the... Um, Talk, uh, my plumber is um, Bruce McKechnie. He, he has said that he has done a lot of um, uh, repiping of houses in town. So this is just not an isolated one. This is, I think the problem is far greater than council realises. Um, a lot of it doesn't get reported. I never reported mine. I was too disgusted. Um, so I think you have a huge problem. And the damage is probably already done. It's too late. Um, what are you, how are you going to address this issue? Well, I think from, from that perspective, we were probably talking about there's options um, through Jess's report for property owners them, to consider um, how they deal with this in the long term, particularly around making sure that their system's um, well designed or well plumbed to, to counter some of the natural occurrences of water corrosion and softness there. We're also in a situation on the back end of the information we've got from this to look at what we can do both in the short term and the longer term. Um, you're right in a sense, there isn't a lot that we can do to um, rectify, you know, the Gloucester water supply system has operated in the current situation for quite some time. The plant, the plant originally was constructed quite some time ago. It, has, it hasn't had a major augmentation for a fair while and um, there isn't a lot that we can do to wind back the time in relation to that. However, what I must stress to it is that the water that has come out of that plant and that, that even this year we have 100% compliance with the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines. So um, largely the plant itself has been producing good quality water. Obviously the source helps that because the source itself is fairly clear and good quality water. As um, Jess was, was documenting earlier, uh, it, it really, the hardness and the, the natural occurrence of the water does control the um, impact that it has on water services. Uh, across the area. So um, we'd be more than pleased to talk about your individual circumstances um, and, and, and happy that you raised them today as well. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Jess. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, you go, man. You're first. Okay. My, I'm Bob. Thanks, Jess, for that uh, really informative uh, presentation. Thanks, Bob. Um, don't you think it's a statistical improbability that... 300 homes, as reported to me by the plumbers, by a plumber, uh, got problems all at once. Now, you've taken uh, uh, readings over 10 years. Is there one time when the dosage went up too high, say? Are you able to finger, put your finger on that? The dosage went up too high on soda ash or on... Yeah, to, to, the, the, to corrode our pipes. You, you know, 300, 300 homes. Is that in all, relation all in a, to chlorine, Bob? Sorry? Is that in, in relation to the chlorine incident in 2015? Uh, I wouldn't think it'd be that because this is 2021 where it all happened. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if, if something happened in 2021 which caused all this to, you mm. know, 300 homes to have these big problems. 
Uh, oh. I'm not sure because when I look, I looked at the plant from the perspective of the water that came into the plant, the water that left the plant, where it arrives in a geographical area. It might be an interesting question about ge the geography of where certain houses were established uh, and the asset itself. We, well, if we I can... Oh, yeah, yeah go on. Sorry. If I can just add, I, I think, um, you know, corrosion is a long-term problem. Um, it doesn't really, you know, ever occur in our experience, and I've been doing this for 40 years, um, on particular short-term incidents, um, even, you know, the chlorine incident of 2015. Um, yeah. That's a very short-term, it, it, you know, it probably doesn't help the situation, but it's unlikely to do any major damage. It really takes several to decades, several years to decades for this sort of stuff to occur. And it's often microbiological. Um, so, you know, that management is just a gradual, slow thing. You know, unfortunately, um, water, as Jess has pointed out, is corrosive. Um, you know, the purer the water, the more corrosive it is. It's um, the universal solvent. So it does just slowly work away and the microbes add to that problem. It usually takes a fair bit of time, at least 10 years and probably more like 20, 30, 40 years. Jess mentioned PEX pipes. Are they the plastic pipes, Bruce? Yeah, well, that's what all the plumbers are using these days. It right. just takes out that risk. You know, copper is an imperfect uh, material and um, we don't really use it so much anymore. The, the, you know, the polybutylene sort of poly pipes are way more common, as you probably know, and mm. um, just get rid of this problem. So that's what everybody's doing now. And yep. if you are going with the copper pipes, I think they do come with a stamp. Um, I don't know if it's the the uh, the is the BSEN 1057 will be in that slide. It, it does come with a stamp that says it's as per that standard. If you do stay with the copper pipes, you said flush the pipes. Um, does that mean turn all your taps on at once? Yes. Right. Fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Especially Thanks, if Bob. you've got a section of your um, pipe that goes out to right out to the very backyard and you hardly ever use the tap. That's the target area that Jess was really sort of referring to. So, um, and again, through design of systems, if the pipe layout actually ended at things like a shower or a toilet that we know gets regularly used, that's going to help improve the situation overall as well. And um, I might just... Over the years, copper pipe, uh, there has been a large degree of manufacturing quality and um, that available. And certainly prior to the establishment of the standard there, as Jess indicated, um, a lot of the, um, the the carbon film that was on through the manufacturing process also um, was detrimental to the, cop the presence of copper pipe corrosion in systems. And, and often the worst cases are, you know, big buildings. Um, so traditionally, uh, you know, hospitals and apartment blocks and those sort of things that were built, especially, you know, more than 20 years ago, have this problem quite commonly and also uh, where there have been you know holiday houses or unoccupied mm. units or houses um, that the water just sits there for a long time it's just corrosive water sitting on a material that uh, isn't perfect is you know over a long time it seems to be the main problem rob can i jump in and ask a question you certainly can i was we're up to the next question so <laughs> That's all right. Um, the report is quite detailed, but in simple terms, what do I tell residents as to the reason for the, the pipe issue? Um, as for water sitting in pipes, I've had that through my house with one of the leaking in four or five different spots as well, and they're, they're used all the time. But in simple terminology, what is the answer? What do I tell residents who have had the plumber come back to them four or five times. Um, I can have a go at that if anyone else wants to um, jump in, let me know, Bruce or Jess or Kenzie. Um, the the bottom line is that there's a, there is a variety of influences over copper pipe corrosion and the, um, the raw water or the water chemistry is just one of them. What we do know of the Barrington is that the, it is largely free of all sorts of things in it, which, is, which gives it a very, um, uh, you know, a more aggressive thing and it has, and it has um, that potential around it. Overall, though, um, we know that benchmarking were better than some and not as good as others. Uh, um, and 
copper pipe is prone to pitting corrosion in a, in a large number of circumstances. So again, it's probably hard to answer the question specifically, Catherine, for everyone, for all the different, very, all the different situations and scenarios that people ask you about, um, but there is a lot that goes into it. And it's, it's not necessarily just the water. And, and I suppose you can add that, um, you know, unfortunately you're not alone. It's the whole East Coast of Australia has this problem we, you know, they're both blessed and cursed that the water's pretty good. And so well, if one you... Of the, um, if, one of the fortunate things that we have, and there's a large project underway at the moment dealing with our reservoirs and our the direct connection of the treatment plant to the system and improving the overall pressure plus the water quality in the reticulation system. But in the future, we've also got a large a further program of investment plan for both replacing the sewer treatment works, which our team is working on, the detailed design of at the moment, and ultimately the addressing the long-term water security, which includes an opportunity for us to look at um, major improvements to the water treatment plant, or in fact, even potentially retire replacement of the water treatment plant, where that gives us an opportunity to have a really good look at the options that Jess presented for changing the way that we dose and what chemicals we use, and in particular, lime and CO2, which I've experienced that other suppliers that um, I've been involved in in the last few years, particularly at Warhope Water Treatment Plant, where um, most of Port Macquarie's water is treated with that system because it had a very similar thing up until just recently. So, May I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, back to the issue of the homes in Gloucester. Now, I believe it's actually over 400 homes. So this happening in this period of time would be unprecedented, I would think. Um, can you tell me, has the water chlorination that's caused the pitting been in any other towns that are in our council? And if it hasn't been, then why has this happened now in Gloucester? Our home is 13 years old, and yet we've had three parts of our pipes had to be cut out because they are pitted. Now, that's quite incredible when the pipes are used... Um, it's not like it's sitting there. So to me, I really appreciated Jess's presentation. Thank you, Jess. And I appreciate the work that the council is doing going forward. However, this doesn't assist us. We're still waiting. I think my first visit to council was the 26th to the 4th at 1.30. Um, that's some months ago. We're still waiting to have our pipes replaced. They have had to put three sections in it. So... I think this is just incredible that a town can have so many issues in such a short period of time. There has to be a reason for this. What would that reason be? Um, one thing I would add there, whilst we've anecdotally um, got reports and we've, we've um, part of the work that we did was actually to map where those reports of the copper corrosion were working with um, the plumbers in town on what they could um, recall where they've had incidents or whether they've mm. had that. We certainly don't have, um, whilst it might be circulating out there of three or 400, we haven't seen the report, the actual um, information to suggest that it's that many. Um, what we will say, though, is that there is a number of, of copper pipe corrosion issues that have gone out there. Uh, largely, they don't in some supplies get reported to us or where they've been reported to us in the past or historically. We haven't captured that information. So it's very difficult for us now to compare on the relativities of it between our water supplies. Um, what we do know is that the data that Jess walked through is um, yeah. suggesting that it, it is potentially um, more aggressive than the water in a lot of the other systems that we do have. Um, but yeah. I do know that other systems and other council areas do, do also have similar or have had um, similar problems as is suggested by the benchmarking. Um, it's Sensi. So I just want to add a little bit for the water. Um, we do find probably um, like the natural water is low in our community harness, etc. But these conditions get worse since 2014, probably around that year. So mm -hmm. I did check the previous data. So probably one of Jess chart, you can see it's a big job. So the previous years, the harness is a row with harness, that things is higher. And then it's a job bit since 2014. And um, I think this one is associated with the um, 
rainfall, how much rainfall we receive in the catchment because oh, it grows like, yeah. Yeah, growth in, in the upper catchment. So it, you can see, oh, just that, that chart you mm. missed. So yes, I've got a copy of that. Thank you. Yeah, so in 2012, you, you can see the trend is higher. So it's always, oh, this one's elk community, probably Han is even more clear. Mm. Yeah. So 2011 to 13, you have the um, higher venue is around 30. And 30 above, and then lower is probably um, 15, close to 20. But this one dropped into some 14. So your lowest one dropped to something line, right? And the highest one is only just above 20. So this one is continue for a few years and then go back to 2020. So it's a January, you can see a, a big spike on the um, calcium harness. That spike is come from um, rainfall we receive in January. So during that, um, the basically, if the rainfall is not enough, so if it's, we don't receive average rainfall, the water from the catchment, they don't get a chance to absorb um, items when they flow through. So they generally have even lower um, harness, harness our community. So that's that's probably, um, yeah, definitely didn't help the situation. Not at all, not at all. Because, I mean, we've had a, a drought for four years and we all know that um, our water supply was exhausted. Um, you know, I appreciate the efforts that, to get the water brought in here to us. Um, but, you know, I, I just, as I said, I'm grateful for all the information. I can see that, you know, moving forward that you're trying to fix things and knowing that we don't, I assume, have to have pop-up pipe now from the uh, metre to our house will be great because we won't have to deal with that issue. But to have so many homes in one area um, to be subjected to this um, is quite incredible. And, you know, the expense to the homeowners is going to be astronomical. Yeah, yeah, I understand that situation. That's that's really unfortunate. So something from um, my my part, we can make problems is we definitely going to investigate the option and then we not say we're going to do it in two or three years. We will get get investigation done in six months. We definitely mm -hmm. go through all the option analysis and then provide the cost. So I will have another council report, report back to council, and then to say that will be the cost for us to make improvement and then get the council's approval to say when we're going to take action. So I think these things, we will continue to communicate back to um, every people attend today's meeting or even people is registered. And then uh, I, I think I want to improve our communication between us and then community member. So that's why, I, like Rob indicated, we hope in future we can have some open days and Good. then bring people to the treatment plan. I think I, I, for my part, I really want to show the people how the treatment plan works and how do we control the water quality? Because it's always that my first priority is make sure that water is safe to people. Mm -hmm. So you drink water and you definitely don't get ill illness from our water. So um, sometimes that clean water didn't not really help this kind of situation because more clean water, the water could be more close. Oh, so. Yes, exactly. I know it's uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. But um, again, as I said, it, it's certainly something has made this happen during this short period of time. I know um, the cluster diagram is on there, but that certainly hasn't covered those homes. I have spoken with um, some plumbers and, you know, they said, oh, yes, we did get together and we did try and put dots on the on the uh, map, but uh, then we thought, oh, no, we'd forgotten all these different people. I mean, it's not what they do. They're not diagnostic people as far as doing that sort of thing. But um, it just is astounding that this has happened. And um, our Catherine Smith, who lives here locally, I mean, she's a person who will cop the brunt of people speaking with her, wanting to know what's going to happen and actually what you can do to assist us having to pay we're looking at thousands of dollars to have our pipes renewed in a 13-year-old home. Why should this be the case? 
there are probably a couple of things relevant to that. One thing we do have is a concealed leak um, rebate scheme, which for people, because often you can often these sorts of things happen underground or in walls over a period of time. They result in water lossage loss as well as the cost of repair or replacement. Um, and we do look at offsetting the um, the costs associated with the water usage. Um, but one of the, the big things, or the, I guess the most important thing that we've got to put forward from our point is that we do have a very large plan of capital work for that. That that that, that plan is is in the order of fifty to sixty million dollars, including mm-hmm. the that's underway. Um, that is all reflected in our pricing path for water, which we're trying to hold very much at the, at the same level. And it's it's like everything we we run very similar to a household bod- budget at the end of the day we've got to recover what it costs to run the water supply and the sewer systems from the users of the systems. So if there's any more costs associated with that, it just translates into higher higher charges um, where we can keep that down. We're trying to keep downwards pressure on that so that we're not increasing um, any more than what we have to because the intention is not to make a profit over time. It's purely to cover those costs, but also to deliver benefits to the community, which is one of the benefits that, Um, the Gloucester community has of being in the mid-coast area is our ability to resource the financial um, value of those projects now than what we would have previously been able to do potentially because we do have a lot more users and um, we do rationalise the cost over those users. So that's where if you look at our, um, our program over the current years, we're certainly investing a substantial and plan to invest a substantial amount into um, look, potentially what is the water and sewer project at $60 million is probably the most ex- ex- extensive infrastructure in, in investment in Gloucester um, that I'd say we'd see over the next 10 years, certainly. So it is probably really timely that we've had this discussion, that we've done the investigation, because it certainly provides a lot of motivation. And I'm sure Councillor Smith would agree that when we bring back a council um, opportunities and options to both help in the short term, but also address it in the longer term, we'll get a lot of support from the council to proceed into that um, as part of our plans. And um, that's that's what we're really looking forward to. But we do take on board that, you know, it has adversely and will continue to impact some residents there um, quite extensively. And uh, for yes. a lot of stuff, you know, as we know, it, is, it isn't, it isn't a deliberate thing. It is, has been a natural result of the water quality in that area. It's also influenced by a lot of other factors that vary from property to property. And that's why it's not necessarily consistent on every particular property. Uh, acknowledging. Well, um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say just on the technical side of it, it's also how much control you have when you do have water of a certain quality. I mean, you've got at the moment, we discussed the soda ash dosing. You can yep. get your pH up. You can get that alkalinity almost up, not quite to where we get it. But if we keep dosing it, this is our only strategy to deal with this water. You keep dosing it, then we're compromising public health through the emergence of bacteria and viruses that that chlorine can't treat. So it's trying to find like that that sweet spot in between. And that's why we talk about doing these superior lime and CO2. It is a more expensive dosing system, but that's because it works works better. It's more sophisticated and you we won't be compromised in disinfection by getting the, the water corrosivity down, especially when you have these periods of drought and yeah. yeah, which it's been extensive. Yes, no, I get that. I get that. But I think, you know, it said here that, um, you know, the treatment plant the, hadn't had a major upgrade or had one in 1980. Um, since 2016, replacement renewal of age, mechanical value, valves, chemical dosing system, electrical equipment, etc., has been undertaken. And, um, you know, that's been happening. But it's 40 years, you know, it's, um, and this town in itself has grown dramatically. Um, everything has to be monitored. When you let a town increase in size, you have to have the infrastructure put in place to cater for that. Yeah. Um, I'm relatively new here, um, well, three and a half years, so that's very new, um, according to locals, but um, it's it's a wonderful town. Um, there's certainly a lot of forethought going into moving forward and what we need to have put in there so in the systems to have a good water supply that's drinkable um Jess I'm not sure if you've tasted our water but I uh I boil it (laughs) and then put it through a filter um 
you know, <laughs> coming from Port Stephens, uh, it's, it's very different. But, um, you know, that's what happens when you move and that's because the water comes from the river and I, I understand that. But I do find it very difficult to accept the fact that um, people will be hurt financially here and it's dreadful for our whole country at the moment. I understand that. But we can't let this go because there's too many people it's happened to. Can I just uh, add a question in there just on top of it all? Sorry, I've just been listening. Um, two points. Would it be reasonable to clarify the extent of the issue by with council actually contacting the half dozen or eight plumbers that are in Gloucester and actually try and get some accurate numbers because you're sort of sitting there saying we, we haven't had reports. It's only anecdotal. Um, I'm a bit the same. I've got two properties that are affected um, and both with feed-in lines, not to do with dead ends or anything like that. So it's, and it's happened all of a sudden. Um, the second question is on the technical side. Is there any evidence that the minor long-term um, wear and tear on pipes, whatever you like to call it, could then have a super hit at a small, in, over a short period, that could exacerbate those long-term issues all of a sudden? Is there any research that would back that up? So if you all of a sudden had a flood event and you have a high dosing of whatever in the system, that that would exacerbate already in-line issues that are there and then that, that would cause your broader problem all of a sudden in a lot of properties. Well, look, maybe I can answer that. Um, the, the, only, the only suspects there are, you know, we've sort of established that the water is a bit corrosive and there are times when it's more corrosive than others. And, you know, there are some targets we have for calcium hardness and alkalinity and all the rest of it. And if cancer goes down the route of lime carbon dioxide dosing, well, those things can be targeted. The only other possible culprit um, is microbes. So microbi microbially induced corrosion, MIC, is a thing that does come and go in some towns um, and maybe uh, could be looked at a little bit further. Um, and, you know, that is about having a bit more chlorine in the system uh, to manage it, which is mm. um, which introduced taste and odours and well, mm. well, chlorine taste. So, you know, that's not always ideal. So again, it's, it's balancing a whole lot of factors, which um, it's hard to deliver all things to all people. So, um, but all these things are being looked at as, as she explained um, and is worth considering. Rob, yes. <coughs> is this, this presentation gonna be available online for people to view? That is our plan. Yeah. It has been recorded. So, so that... could we could we have that? And also, I don't know what the concealed leak program. Could we have a link to that on that same page and some questions and answers um, uh, attached? And I guess the proposed open days. I think that's a fantastic idea. I know um, the staff work really hard, especially with um, the old. Um, treatment plant that, that we had. So I think that's a fantastic idea. So if we could have all that information together to direct residents to, um, I think that would be worthwhile. We can yes. put all that together. I just also would like to go back to one of the questions earlier. A lot of the work we're doing at the moment um, associated with the new reservoir at Cemetery Road, um, the new rising mains through town is, re is really focusing on the first priority, making sure that we have enough pressure and volume to support the growth of the town for both now and well and truly into the future. Um, it will also take, ease a lot of the pressure on our operators to deal with fluctuations in raw water quality simply by the fact that they will have more storage available within the reticulation system so that they can get. So that has been our priority. Um, that then is then translating into the sewer treatment works, which is also an aged asset um, from comparing the water treatment and the sewer treatment, it's probably the sewer treatment definitely needs some more work first. And then ultimately, um, we're also planning to deal with both water security and the long-term water treatment um, together as part of the last phase of our, of our investment in the, um, in the area. So um, hopefully you guys in the Gloucester community get so sick of seeing myself and Chenzi and the rest of the team on all our projects <laughs> we've got coming forward um, that um, you 
love to see the back of us one day in about 10 years time when we've um, when we've been able to help and sort out a lot of these issues um, so we're going to be very um, there very regularly um, and working with our team and our consultants like CWT and a lot of the other um, specialists that we use and rely upon to do work as well as our contractors like FB contracting at the moment that are in town to deliver um, better outcomes for the community so it's a um, exciting times of head. We'll work on getting that information up on to our website. We'll also, we've got everyone's email addresses so we can um, both prompt you with um, letting you know when things are up there and also pointing you into the information as it comes up down there. Um, we certainly, yes. if there aren't any more direct questions, we are a little bit over time and I appreciate again everybody's attendance tonight. Um, we'll certainly have some open days in the future as soon as the COVID restrictions lift. And um, we welcome the opportunity to, to meet and talk with everyone um, at any point in time. Um, if everyone, if there, if there aren't any more questions, what I will do is firstly thank Jess and Bruce both for joining us tonight and also the work that they've done looking into the background. Um, thank Kenzie and her team for the work that they have done as well in supplying the information, but also in the general day-to-day -day operation of our system. Um, and thank you. I guess you guys again for showing an interest and wanting to be involved and bringing this issue to us so that we can have a discussion and further and, and get to better outcomes. I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, we definitely will have follow up um, emails to everyone who registered and then send, send the link um, once this video is available on their website and also send the uh, link of the information um, you required and also keep you updated what we'll be able to do open open days in future. So I, I hope, finger crossed, just in a couple months we'll be able to run it. Really looking forward to meet someone face to face from the community. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. It's been great. Good. Thank you. Yes.